we are live to tape so again welcome to Monday morning's plenary lecture uh, this week we are going to look at really an alternative view to Berkeley's idealism namely a materialistic view of ontology uh, but that really is the underpinning of a particular facet of this kind of ontology and it's going to be articulated for us by a contemporary philosopher. We're going to fast forward now to the late 20th century, very close to our time, and look at the work of Paul Churchland and also his wife, uh, Patricia Churchland. Both of them share this particular view, which they call eliminative materialism. So it's a, uh, a radical kind of materialism. You know, we've seen Descartes' radical skepticism and we've seen Berkeley's fairly radical idealism, denying that there's an external world at all, independent of a perceiver. Uh, so now we're going to come to a position which maybe some of you um, are more inclined to accepting, perhaps through your own reflections or experience of the world or through your own habitual way of thinking about things. Uh, we do live in a uh, quote-unquote materialistic culture, although that normally has... Uh, the connotation of a kind of economic uh, value that we place on material things. Uh, but remember, we're lo looking at something probably deeper than the social science, namely the ontology. Uh, and uh, Churchland is concerned to show that if we really ask that fundamental question about existence, what is there, um, then for him, uh, unlike Berkeley, there, there are only material things in the world. And... Uh, but because he's going to push this as far in that materialistic direction, ontologically speaking, as Berkeley does in the direction of idealism, uh, he's going to really uh, touch on a very interesting debate that is ongoing uh, today uh, in neuroscience uh, and in philosophy of mind. Uh, and uh, something that maybe some of you have thought of already, but now we're, we're verging on to a really interesting question, and that pertains to the nature of consciousness itself, ultimately an unanswered question, but one that's quite hotly debated and has been the focus of both the neuroscientific and philosophical inquiry for uh, the past half century, if, if not more, actually. So that, that should give you some sense of where we're headed uh, with Churchland. And as usual, in order to digest his reading, I'm going to introduce some new terms to you today, uh, which he mentions as he needs to to push his own thesis. Uh, the name of the reading, Ramsey's okay. Um, it's called eliminative materialism, and again, I always get concerned at this kind of question because it's not a philosophical question, it's a housekeeping question, and uh, I know that um, last week uh, on my Thursday class, the internet connection was quite poor, and I was not able to um, convey in, in, in verbally in class this information, but uh, Aisha's on the ball and she's telling everybody that it's on the schedule. So uh, I once again urge you, and I know some of you may be freshmen and not well attuned to navigating a university, everything has been laid out for you in advance of the start of class and all you need to do in that quote-unquote hour you spend outside of a class for every hour we spend in it is to look at your Google Drive folders and read the schedule. And then you will see without surprises every Monday morning which reading we're going to do. And so you need to be proactive uh, and, and not rely on being spoon-fed. Okay, that's part of the demands of a university curriculum. Uh, so, uh, obviously, uh, some of you are well aware of this, and I'm not going to preach to the choir. Okay, so the terminology we need to introduce is terminology that pertains to the so-called mind-body problem. Uh, are you aware of this term itself? If I enter this into the chat room, uh, have you, any of you at all heard this phrase before, the so-called mind-body problem, or sometimes it's referred to as the mind-brain problem. 
I just want to know if someone could say yes or no in the chat room, you know, whether this rings any bells for you or whether it's brand new. Okay, mind-body problem, mind-brain problem. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, and that's why we're introducing it to you. It's something you may already have thought of without having named it as such. Uh, remember, if we go back to Descartes and his substance dualism, he's proposing that there are two fundamental substances, mind stuff and body stuff, right? Uh, thinking things and extended things, which, which translates into uh, mind and body. And then, as you also know from our discussions, perhaps, uh, uh, that, that if you're a dualist, you also need to propose a way in which the two separate things interact with each other. And so you really can't be a dualist without positing a third, a third thing, which is the kind of interface. But let me ask it in a different way. Uh, how many of you um, kind of think in Descartes' way uh, that uh, that you have something called a mind and that your mind is in some way or other different from your body. Uh, does that make sense to you prior to this philosophy course? Did you ever consider uh, that you, you know, you have a thing called a mind so someone can ask you what's on your mind and you could say so, but that's not necessarily coextensive with or sharing the same properties of your body, right? Okay, so many of you are saying yes. So it's really owing partly to Descartes' influence that that vocabulary itself has permeated our culture and not just English language cultures. It permeates all uh, primarily Western civilization, no matter what the indigenous languages are. Uh, the Indo-European languages are all basically uh, fraught with this uh, difficulty. And that is, if mind and body are different, then how are they different? Uh, and how do they interact? You know, we're not escaping Descartes at all just by, by thinking of mind as one thing and body as another. You remember that Descartes posits the existence of God as necessary to manage this interaction. Uh, now, we have today a different kind of spin on that debate and it really goes in monistic directions. It goes away from God. At one time, it was quite fashionable and acceptable and normal for scientists to believe in God, and they saw no contradiction all the way through the Enlightenment. If you look at Newton um, and, you, and you look at the, at the great figures of the 18th, 19th century up to the 20th century in Einstein, you will find some of the greatest scientists have no, have no problem or experience no contradiction believing in laws of nature. Uh, that science discovers, and in God as uh, ostensibly the creator of nature and its laws. And there was no inherent contradiction in that. But because the fashion of our, generally speaking, Western civilization has become more and more materialistic, and this is the thing Berkeley was warning about in his dialogue with Hylas, if you recall Berkeley's ul ulterior motive, he was, he was concerned about the effects of materialism on culture to the neglect of, of spirituality. So that was partly why he promoted his idealism through this dialogue to remind people about God. But nowadays, uh, it's, I think, the other way around. If you go across the street to the science building and, and conduct a survey, I think you'd find many, perhaps most scientists, no, no longer believe in God necessarily. You know, they're either atheists or agnostics, but they don't need God as, um, you know, um, to, to explain uh, anything. They think that the laws of the universe are sufficiently explained by themselves. Uh, that's what um, the uh, Marquis de Laplace told, uh, you know, Laplace, who the great, the great uh, author of celestial mechanics and probability theory and other things, he, he presented Napoleon uh, early in the, in the 19th century. Around 1805, he, he gave Napoleon a five-volume work, I think, on, uh, on, on celestial mechanics, and Napoleon said, uh, where is God in any of this? And, and Laplace very famously said to him, I have no need of that hypothesis. So it, it became possible gradually and into the 20th century, very commonplace for scientists uh, to uh, basically ignore the whole question of theology and try to explain science, uh, as we say, sui generis, or uh, following from its own premises. So we're going to do a bit of philosophy of science as well. Um, we can't avoid that, uh, and in fact, it's very interesting to do. So Churchill is just going to make us mindful in the first paragraph, and we're going to go there in a moment. I just want you to understand that he's not simply arguing in favor of materialism as a way of explaining phenomena. So he's going to take 
essentially the position of Hylas if he were in that debate with Barclay. You know, Barclay is Philonus, Churchland is Hylas, and he's a materialist, and he believes that all there is is, is stuff, right? In other words, material substance is what everything is made of, and it follows from that premise, which for him is universal, that what we refer to as the human mind is not really a thing uh, called mind. It is in some way a hand-waving explanation uh, without very much understanding or specificity of what's going on in the brain. So this is a way of essentially solving the mind-body problem. You can either, like Barclay, get rid of of the brain and say, no, 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 everything is an idea in the mind, including, you know, the, the, the so-called existence of our brains, it's just an idea in the mind. Or you can go the route of Churchland and say, no, 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 uh, the mind, in fact, doesn't exist at all. The mind is just a name we have for what the brain is doing. But because neuroscience is still in its infancy, uh, we know least about this organ. It is, without a doubt, the most complicated organ in the body. I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's incredible that modern medical science has figured out how to replace, basically transplant every major organ, I think, almost all major organs, certainly the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys. Yes, those things can be <clears throat> transplanted with ever increasing uh, success rates. But nobody has <laughs> figured out how to transplant a brain. And that's, a, you know, for a lot of for a lot of reasons. But but basically, what uh, what Churchill wants to do is push our understanding <clears throat> of the brain forward by eliminating from our everyday vocabulary certain kinds of what he calls folk psychological terms, which for him just obscure the path to better understanding of the brain. And that's what eliminative materialism means. It's not just materialism in the sense of an ontological commitment to the existence of, of stuff uh, you know, that the world is made of, but it's also more proactive than that because he shows in the history of science by some very good, well-chosen examples how science progresses not only by discovering, let's say, better accounts of how things work in the phenomenal world by giving us better and newer and, and, and always improving theories. Science certainly works that way, but it critically works in another way at the same time. Not only does it give us perhaps a better theory, but it also works by what? By getting rid of, by jettisoning, by, by eliminating worse theories, theories that end up being shown to be false or, or, or basically misconceived. So science works both by eliminating falsehood as well as by discovering uh, some forms of truth. And he wants to focus on the importance of that eliminative process as a way of advancing our knowledge. And he hopes, therefore, that a mature theory of neuroscience, which is a science still in its relative infancy, but it's, it's his hope that a mature theory of neuroscience will be able to eliminate all this baggage, uh, which, he, which he lumps under the the, the heading of folk psychology, uh, baggage which has been with us for 2,500 years in our discourse and has completely permeated everyone's normal way of thinking, but he says this is part of the problem and that impedes our progress, okay? So he's a radical materialist and a very interesting one. So are we clear about this? And, uh, you know, so the context of his, of his paper, uh, is, which is part of a book, is, is really uh, going to be set in the so-called mind-body or mind-brain problem and his attempt to help us find a way to resolve it. Okay, are there any questions about any of that? We're going to jump momentarily to the text and have a look at Churchland's words. Does anybody have any questions about this setup, or is it clear? I just want the orientation to be clear, okay, of where we're headed. Clear, Jeremy? All right, thank you. Everybody is clear. Good. You must have all had your coffee this morning. I'm having mine, so it's good to be clear at the beginning. And as you know, clarity at the beginning will only lead us into perplexity as we as we look at some of the nuts and bolts of the actual philosophical problem that we're going to treat this morning. But it's good to start with some clarity about the nature of the problem. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump into Churchland. And if those of you who are interested in this reading, 
uh, certainly can do more. You can read his book. And his wife is Patricia, uh, and she shares his view. She's written an interesting book called Neurophilosophy in much the same vein. And there's quite a lot of literature by them. And, of course, there are also arguments made against them. And later in the Churchland reading, we'll encounter some arguments in favor of his theory that he puts forward, and also, importantly, some arguments that people might want to pose uh, against his theory, and, and he will need to respond to those in order to defend his position. And that's what we do, of course, in philosophy. Okay, so let's see if uh, the screen share works. Looks like Zoom is cooperating this morning so far. Bear with me while it loads. All right. Can you see the... Uh, are you able to see this? Yes, we could see your screen. Thank you very much. So we have eliminative materialism, and now you know why it's called that. It's not just materialism, but it's a very proactive uh, brand of materialism. And he begins by discussing the identity theory, and I need to explain that term. Again, I, I remind you that my explanations are off the cuff. If you want uh, more carefully formulated definitions and explanations of these new terms that we encounter today, you can always find them online if you just Google identity theory or go to the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy or the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy for any good, any good online philosophy resource. You'll get some very detailed explanations of, of, you know, that the theory and its ramifications and implications. But the basic identity theory is a dualist theory, which supposes that we should be able, in principle at least, to match up what's going on in the mind with what's going on in the brain. In other words, just in case you believe, and some people do, uh, that, that what's going on in the mind is really a function of what's going on in the brain or a reflection of what's going on in the brain, then there must be some physical account we can give for what we think, what we feel, what, what you know, the contents of our mind, what's, what's on your mind at a given time, what philosophers call intentional states, what are your beliefs, what are your hopes, what are your desires, what are your fears, what are your aspirations, uh, what, what are your volitions, these things that we call intentional states of mind must have on uh, on an identity theory account, uh, some some kind of corresponding state of the brain. So if the mind is in a certain state, then the brain would be in a certain state. And what we need to do, therefore, is give some kind of account of how brain states and mind states match up. Okay, and that would be the identity theory. So if your mind were in a certain state, then obviously your brain would be in a corresponding state. If you change your state of mind, then you would be changing your state of brain. And this would also work the other way around, like because if your brain is being stimulated by some external sensory uh, data that are gating their way in and changing your brain state, um, then presumably that also changes your mind state, yes? So brain state and mind state are maybe not two different things, but two different ways of expressing something. And what we really need to do to make this identity theory work is to actually build the map. And that turns out to be an, almost an impossible task. And it's impossible for a number of reasons. It, firstly, we're too early in our understanding of the brain to be able to, to, to give such an account, uh, you know, how to translate a, a mind state into a brain state, right? Very, very difficult to do. And also... We don't really know what thinking is or what thoughts are or how they, you know, we know what they are when we think them, but we're, it's totally unclear how neurons and, and synapses and neurochemical transmitters and all that stuff, all the electrical chemical activity that's going on in the brain, how that translates into a thought or even how a memory is stored. And believe me, there are several Nobel Prizes just waiting to be picked up. And I hope some of you will do this if you're involved in biological science, neuroscience, you know, this kind of field, where one day we'll be able to actually understand how uh, a sensory experience in the world gets encoded, because it must be encoded somehow. If memories are biologically saved and stored and retrieved, they must be coded in some biological way. So how that works, nobody has a clue. I mean, there are theories that they give names to, like the engramic theory and other theory, but no one's really explaining how it happens, to my knowledge. And so there must be a coding 
and no one has yet decoded that. And when you retrieve a memory, if I ask you to think about, you know, your grandmother or think about what you had for breakfast yesterday, most of you can retrieve some kind of a memory. How do we do this? How do we then retrieve it from storage if it's a biologically stored in some coded way? And how do we retranslate that? How do we decode that back into a visual image in what we call our minds? So we have a lot of explaining to do. And Churchland wants to, in a sense, cut to the quick and say, no, 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 we're never going to get there this way. Uh, the uh, identity theory and this inter-theoretic reduction in terms of explaining one thing, you know, uh, via another is never going to work. It's just not going to work. And so he says, clearly, eliminative materialism doubts that the correct neuroscientific account of human capacities, when we finally discover one, assuming that we do, that it will produce, he doubts, it will produce a neat reduction of our common sense framework of what the mind is doing that we speak about in what he calls folk psychological terms, everyday language, and how that really matches up with what's going on in the brain. Okay, very deep questions. Yes, that, that's right, that's right, uh, Ramses. Nobody understands how dream images are formed either, this kind of imaging. But obviously there's something going on in the brain, and that is being in some way mapped or translated or, you know, re-encoded into a dream experience. And some of it is based on memory and some of it is based on what you experienced, you know, that day, or some of it might be based on a past experience or in some cases on a future experience, if you believe that people have that ability. Uh, but how this, uh, again, translates into mental imagery is, is quite unknown. So there's a lot of work to be done. And, uh, and Churchland's contribution is to try to shorten the path, if you like, to try to, to, to eliminate the unnecessary uh, impediments which are actually preventing more rapid understanding or development of understanding in neuroscience. So it's very ambitious, and it's also very interesting. So I think you get that main point. So he's saying that actually not only uh, is our notion of intertheoretic reduction not working very well, but he goes on to say on the next page that it's a misrepresentation of our eternal state of internal states and activity. So the ordinary language that we use to describe, as Descartes did, what's going on, so called in his mind, is a misrepresentation of what the brain is doing. And we're never going to find out what the brain is doing by thinking about it in terms of mind or mental language. So that's what we need to eliminate. And he then goes to history. He's not just arguing without a foundation. And here, if any of you are interested in the history of science, you'll discover that he is, in, in, in a sense, building on a very well-established foundation and edifice for this kind of work. So uh, how many of you are science students? Some of you uh, are undoubtedly majoring in, in physics or chemistry or biology. Uh, is, that, is that true? Could you just say yes in the chat room if you're uh, studying natural science, what we call natural physical science. Yes, some of you. Okay, or engineering for that matter. At least one, two, three. Okay, so some of you are studying natural science. And if you are studying natural science, then you know immediately, I hope, that the textbooks are always changing. And this is not like philosophy textbooks where they just keep bringing out new editions every year to try and make you buy the, pardon my cynicism, to try and make you spend the money on a new edition when it's really not that different from the old edition. Okay, in the humanities, this is less critical. But in science, it's absolutely critical. As some of you science students, I hope, know that if you were to use a textbook in your field, let's say you're studying biology, if you were using a textbook that, were, that was 50 years old, it would be outdated. You couldn't possibly possibly be up to speed with an old text, right? Even in some cases, last year's textbook will be wrong or out of date. So science books are constantly being updated because science is constantly being updated. It is self-correcting on a good day when it's not politically interfered with, I, I hasten to add. When scientists are left to do what they do best, they do basically make some kind of progress in reliable knowledge. Although they never answer all the questions, they give us a lot of reliable knowledge. But that means, as a consequence, that the textbooks that they teach from are also going to change on a regular basis. That, that's to be expected, yes? So there are a lot of terms 
in science that you today as science students will never have encountered. Why? Because they are long, long removed from the older texts. And here are his examples, and I think you'll find them instructive. I think this will be a, like a very illuminating for some of you when you think about it. He goes on to say in, in this highlighted passage, uh, for most of the 18th and 19th centuries, learned people believed that heat was a subtle fluid held in bodies, much the way water is held in a sponge. So there was no good theory of heat uh, in terms of uh, heat being molecular motion, which we know it to be today. But in, in the 18th and 19th centuries, th this was not known. And so the, the, the pre prevailing theory of heat, which was totally wrong, but widely believed, because they had no better theory, was that heat was a kind of fluid, and that things that emanated it kind of got rid of it the way uh, water would evaporate or be squeezed from a sponge. And they had a name for this fluid, supposed fluid. It was called caloric. Not, not the same as calories, but caloric. That was, that was the name of this so-called substance that made things hot. And it flowed within a body, or it flowed from one body to another. They would explain, therefore, you know, conduction of heat as a flow of caloric from one body to another. And, and it was caloric that produced thermal expansion, which they knew about. They built railways. They knew the railroad tracks expanded in hot weather and contracted in cold weather. They had to put gaps between, you know, they had to do all this in terms of engineering, too. And they were able to engineer great railways, but they had a wrong theory about what was causing thermal expansion. If you're an engineer, you need to know what works. If you're a scientist, you need to understand why and how it works. It's possible to build something really effective without knowing how it works. Uh, that's called techne. Human beings were able to light fires, yes, for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years before the episteme, meaning the knowledge of exactly how combustion works, was, was, was understood. So that's, uh, you know, very important. That techne, oh, these are Greek words, yes? Techne means knowing how to do something. So how to build a railroad and how to deal with thermal expansion. But contrast that with episteme, which is not how to do it, but why things work the way they do. And so caloric was an attempt to explain how it was, why it was that the tracks expanded and contracted with different ambient temperatures. So anyway, this was the notion uh, of caloric. It emerged from this attempt to explain thermal expansion and so forth. Okay, now we have a better theory. Uh, we know that what we call heat is the energy of motion of molecules vibrating and jostling with each other and absorbing energy perhaps from an external source and therefore moving quicker and therefore we experience that through our senses as a body heating up or if it's losing energy, it cools down. So we have a much better theory now, uh, basically molecular motion. And in consequence, we eliminated the word caloric. Are we clear? This is why you won't find it. <laughs> you won't find it in your textbooks anymore. It has been eliminated because we have actually a far more precise explanation of the phenomenon under consideration. And another example, this one I love because it's, it's very amusing. And uh, again, this is a word many of you Maybe all of you have never heard, and for good reason. There was a theory of combustion which uh, went like this. Well, when a piece of wood burns or when a piece of metal rusts, it's actually giving up a substance called phlogiston. Okay, it's releasing phlogiston. That's Greek, P-H-L-O-G-I-S-T. Okay, phlogiston was this mysterious substance that was thought to explain what happens when we encounter combustion. So combustion is, as we know today, an oxidation reduction reaction. But going back to the, again, the 18th and 19th centuries, this was not understood. Certainly early 19th century to mid 19th century, not understood. So it was thought that um, that uh, substance that burned or rusted was giving off this mysterious substance called phlogiston and it was being released. And then when uh, all the phlogiston was released, then the combustion ended. So that was the kind of explanation that people had to be satisfied with. So when the fire burns out, right, and you're left, you started off with, with logs in the fireplace, and then the fire burns for a long time, it gives off heat, gives off light, then it's embers, and then it's eventually ashes, which stop burning. The explanation was that the fire stopped burning because all the phlogiston 
was exhausted. Uh, and, and what you were left with, they had this very fancy scientific name, uh, very amusing today. They, they said, well, the ashes were just deflogisticated mass, right? When all the phlogist, when all the phlogiston is used up, then the, what's left is deflogisticated, right? There's no more phlogiston left. So that sounds very impressive. If you point to the pile of ashes and say, oh, that's deflogisticated mass, you may think you have an explanation. And that was the explanation that was believed. But nowadays, we have, we think, a much better explanation, which you chemistry students will know to be oxidation reduction reactions. So we don't need this word phlogiston. In fact, can you begin to see his point that the explanation that was widely accepted, namely phlogiston, was not only an incorrect explanation, but it was a misleading explanation. Because if you believe in something that doesn't exist, or if you believe you have an explanation when in fact you don't, it made that belief made dead in your power of inquiry. So you stop looking for a better explanation because you think you already have the explanation. Is this clear? It is a very important point. And it applies just as strongly today to widely held beliefs. And so I hope you're getting something from this that's really valuable. And uh, Kendrick, you're going to say that from now on, you mean techne versus episteme? Is that a useful distinction for you? I'm, I'm glad if it is, uh, because again, techne means knowing, you know, how to do something with really not necessarily knowing how, why it works the way it does. But episteme is the deeper basis of knowledge, not only how to do something, but actually why doing things in a certain way produces the desired effects. That's the, the episteme word, the root of epistemology also means it means uh, a deeper form of knowledge. Okay, so we don't encounter phlogiston in chemistry texts anymore, but if you went to a library, <laughs> I dare say if you went to a library, and uh, yes, that's right, Kendrick, deflogisticated mass, that's, that's, that's right, that's what it used to be called, <laughs> and uh, you could try this at home, you know, you're Amuse your, amuse your friends and family with this theory of phlogiston. Uh, now, if you go to a library and dust off some really old chemistry textbooks, I don't know dating back how far, but you would encounter that. Just as, you know, I encountered uh, textbooks when I was doing this kind of research into history of science, not that far back, about a century ago, roughly a century ago, in the 1920s, certainly chemistry texts would teach that there were two different conservation laws, namely conservation of energy and conservation of matter or mass. And those were treated as separate laws. So on the one hand, energy was conserved, uh, transformed, yes, and somewhat non-recoverable due to entropy. That they, some, they understood, but they thought that energy and matter were two different things. And so you had a conservation law pertaining to energy and a conservation law pertaining to mass or matter, right, stuff. And those were in the chemistry text as two separate laws. And also the physics texts of the day uh, would, would talk about these two separate conservation laws. Now, we don't see that anymore. They, they only have one law now to describe what used to be described by two laws. And that law is, is a hyphenated law, right? It's now called... I'll type it in. Some of you know this already. It's, it's now called, instead of separate laws, it's called conservation of what? Anybody know? Conservation of energy matter, right? Hyphenated. Conservation of energy matter. It's one law, not two. Why? Why do they hyphenate energy matter? Anybody know? Why did, how did two separate laws become one law? Energy mass equivalence. That's right, Arsh. Exactly right. And who gave us that? Who proved this first? Does anybody know? Einstein, exactly. In fact, to my knowledge, the only equation ever to be on the cover of Time magazine, if you want to look for mathematical equations on the cover of Time magazine, you have to look at a lot of covers. You won't find any except for one time when Einstein's theories became believed. And, of course, the famous equation, which I'll just type in here, uh, E equals mc squared, was Einstein's equivalence equation. Yes, and I'm sure all you know this equation, uh, even if you don't know how to derive it. Uh, Einstein was the first to derive it. So that shows that energy, 
on the one hand is equal to mass times velocity of light squared. Yes, that's E equals mc squared. And that is why when it became believed they were able to eliminate what had hitherto been two different laws and realize that there's an equivalence between matter and energy. And so they could say, well, we only need one law, which is more elegant. It's always better to eliminate unnecessary uh, entities and to, to not simplify things, but it, it basically to condense things into the most robust and elegant explanation possible, which often turns out to be a simpler explanation than the one that may have been in circulation previously. So uh, E equals mc squared is the equivalence relation. So we only need one law. And similarly, uh, you can look at older textbooks of biology or older textbooks of any of the natural sciences, and you'll discover things in there that no longer exist. Uh, one of my favorite ones uh, was the uh, before genetics uh, and, and ontogeny and phylogeny, there was a theory, uh, there was a homuncular theory of gestation. Uh, you know, people didn't know let me let me put this word in a homunculus does anyone know what that means it's a latin word it's a homunculus it means a little man okay a homunculus little literally means a little man so people thought that this is how gestation occurred that actually all babies were preformed and does anybody has anybody seen those Russian dolls? The, the what are they called? Matryoshka dolls, where each doll contains a smaller version of itself. You've seen those dolls, right? They're painted dolls. You have a big one, and then inside the big one, there's a little one, and this little and little and little all the way. They're very pretty, right? Matryoshka dolls. Well, that was the homuncular theory of gestation. So they thought that every human baby, okay, contained already. <laughs> the the smaller versions of of human babies of the next generation and those babies that were unborn contained smaller versions of the, the the next generation after them and that's how they thought that gestation occurred that actually it was like a bunch of matryoshka dolls they didn't understand anything about cell division <laughs> and about what you know what what we today call ontogeny and phylogeny and the you know the whole the whole gestation process so yeah but you can look it up jeremy and it wasn't that long ago i mean again a couple of hundred years ago biology was in just it's not in saying jesse it's it's an attempt i mean i understand compared to what we know today it is but it, you want to think about it people we're we're on a good day rational creatures right so we always think that there's some coherent explanation that we can give yes that's right arsh there are infinite number of generations going back in the womb so you understand once again we encounter this notion of infinite regress and why it's totally unacceptable right we cannot just have infinite generations the matryoshka dolls are not infinite you know there's a certain limit okay but uh, what what we try to do as as human beings is is to is to explain things you know we we we, se we seek explanations we have big brains and our big brains are consecrated to learning and and we want to explain things we're a creature that wants to explain and uh, the the process of of arriving at sound explanations is not by any means easy and one of the difficulties as you're now seeing is that we come up with explanations and it's very hard at the time uh, to know whether the explanation is, in fact, the sound one, the correct one, or whether it's absolutely and totally wild and off the track. But we have to try. And this is the interplay in science between hypothesis and experiment, right? Uh, the theoretical science may produce hypotheses, and then it's the job of the uh, experimental scientists to test and to devise experiments for testing hypotheses and either we confirm the hypothesis by experiment which doesn't mean it's proved it just means we have a little more reason to believe it or we disconfirm it and once the hypothesis is disconfirmed it has to be radically changed or in fact eliminated because it's no longer giving us the explanation we require so um, he, that, that's a wonderful question uh, Ramses, and I'm going to repeat this because it's really, really important that you're asking. And Ramses is asking as follows, if some scientific theories in the past were considered underdeveloped at the time, 
or indeed, now we know that we're dead wrong, it could be, right? But at least underdeveloped. According to this theory, how would we know if the, if the laws and theories of today are inaccurate, even if they're widely accepted? That's a brilliant question, Ramses. And, and the, the answer philosophically is we can't know for sure. Back to Descartes, we really don't know for sure because it's possible that we have a really good explanation or a, a well-sounding explanation for something which still could turn out to be totally wrong or wrong-headed or in need of some critical modification. But this is the work of science. And you will also notice sociologically, as if that weren't difficult enough, arriving at the, how do we know from all possible theories out there which ones are the correct ones? We don't. There is no a priori method for knowing. You can't even write a computer program, you know, with a supercomputer that will crunch all these data and then tell you a winnow out, you know, the, the, the correct theories from the incorrect ones. It, there's no way we can know this a priori. We develop slowly. We have to do experiments that confirm or disconfirm the hypotheses that we accept, and then we will modify the hypotheses. Sometimes we, we get lucky. We're able to jettison an entire theory as being unsound and then replace it with a better theory. And this is what is called, and I'll give you a technical word. You don't have to know this. It's a fairly uh, advanced word, only because it has a lot of syllables, but I'll give it to you uh, since you're asking. And I think it's a great question. It's called verisimilitude, verisimilitude, and what that means, okay, that, that, that word verisimilitude means an approach to truth. It means an approach to truth. In other words, we don't necessarily always get the absolute and final truth about something from science, but what we do get if the science is thriving in, 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 and it's not interfered with politically, I repeat, if science does its job without interference, then it will get closer and closer to truth. So it's like asymptotic. You get better and better theories, even if you're still not getting the whole truth and nothing but the truth, you're getting closer and closer to the truth. So the understanding improves. Is this clear? So we don't necessarily get absolute truth from science either, but we get closer and closer on a good day. So we have more and more confidence in, in the science we're getting. But, well, that's right, Arsh. You, you enjoy the journey, you know, because the destination, you know, I can give it to you in another way since, I mean, you guys are really on the ball this morning. You're getting this big picture, I think, in a, in a very good way. And uh, so, so let, me, let me give you a, a kind of a, an analogy or a metaphor uh, or a simile that, that will help you see this. If we imagine that that our reliable knowledge, we do have fairly reliable knowledge, or we think we do, and if we imagine that our reliable knowledge is in the form of a sphere, all right, so it's like a sphere, the simile is our reliable knowledge is like a sphere, so everything that's inside the sphere, we're pretty sure of, but we could still modify it, right, subject to new findings, but everything in the sphere is what we call pretty reliable knowledge, and then everything outside the sphere is the unknown. So the surface of that sphere is the interface between what we know and what we don't know. And so the questions that science are, is asking today, those questions that scientists ask, are the questions that they encounter on the surface of the sphere, where what we know in a given subject meets what we don't know. Okay, so if you imagine that simile, then here's the, what happens. As our reliable knowledge grows, the sphere grows in volume, correct? The more knowledge we pack into that sphere, you know, the bigger the sphere becomes. Our knowledge expands. All sciences expand their knowledge. So the sphere is expanding always, correct? But if the sphere is expanding always, now the point, Arsh, if the sphere of reliable knowledge is always expanding, then what's happening to the surface area? The volume gets bigger for sure. So that means we know more and more. But what happens to the surface area of the sphere? As the sphere expands, the surface area increases. But what does that mean in our, in our simile? More questions, you got it. So as the surface of the sphere gets bigger, we have more and more questions because as our interface between what is known and what is unknown gets, what is unknown gets bigger, then we simply are gonna have more questions. 
and it never ends. In theory, it never ends because uh, as we know more and more, we discover that we don't know more and more also. <laughs> yeah. So as our reliable knowledge increases, we know what we learn, what we know is that there's so much more out there that we don't know. And there's going to be no end to knowing in that sense. That's why science is never finished. Uh, well, Arsha, I don't think that it is necessarily frustrating. It's the fun, as Ramsey said, of mysteries. If you like to answer questions or try to answer challenging questions, then certainly uh, that science is going to be a way in which you can attempt that. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I don't see that necessarily this has to be frustrating. It's a challenge to us. And uh, that, that that's part of the human condition. We want to find explanations for things. And, and that's how the world works, okay? So back to the point, though, and all this came out of a very, very important point, and, and that was, I think, Ramsey's point, that even if we consider at the moment that we have a body of reliable knowledge, and arguably we do, even so, some of what we believe to be true may simply be incomplete or, in fact, misconceived. So we can never really be 100% sure that some fundamental laws that today we take to be true might turn out to be in fact untrue or in some way in need of modification. And that, that once again tells you why we always need healthy skepticism. And yes, basically back to uh, Sudan or back to the reading. So Churchill believes that neuroscience gives better answers than, than, well, not than ontological beliefs, because that's also an ontological belief. Churchill's belief that neuroscience is the way to explain what goes on in the mind is itself an ontological belief. He's getting rid of the, of the mental descriptions that we have of those kinds of phenomena, or the, what he calls folk psychology, and he's focusing on neuroscience as his hope for giving us answers, so that itself is an ontological belief. So Churchill, to, to, to correct or perhaps to, to, you know, to modify your claim, so Churchill believes that neuroscience gives us a better account, or will in the long run give us a better account than folk psychology. But in order for that to happen, we have to be prepared to eliminate the false terms that are in circulation from folk psychology, just as we eliminated caloric and phlogiston and the homuncular theory uh, of gestation and the starry night of the heavens before Copernicus's time. And you can look at other, other kinds of phenomena, and he gives more examples. Witches, is, uh, witchcraft is another example he gives, right, on the same page. It was once thought that witches existed. And during the kind of insane persecutions that went on at the height of uh, which we still have that expression, witch hunting, right? Uh, from, from that horrific time when any number of women in Europe particularly, but also in Salem, Massachusetts famously, um, were accused of witchcraft and many were in fact burned for this crime. And well, what we think today is a little bit different. Uh, we, we, we recognize that witches exist in terms of being uh, Halloween costumes. Some of you may, you know, dress your kids up or you dress yourselves up on Halloween as witches. I mean, that would be acceptable, but we don't think that that means you have magical powers, you know, of any kind. We think it's a costume. But, but we've now concluded the concept of which is a kind of mistake in our conceptual framework that misrepresents what people were doing and misrepresents their behavior, which attracted this accusation. Modern theories would tell us, says Churchland, that uh, perhaps there was mental illness, perhaps there was suspicion, you know, of a, of a religious superstition, uh, which would uh, demonize certain people uh, or women in this case as being as being practitioners of witchcraft. Maybe somebody had bad luck and they thought that their neighbor had cast a spell on them. And since superstition is always with us in the world, it was very easy to blame somebody for something that, in fact, they had absolutely no responsibility for. But that hasn't stopped in today's world either. The media are constantly demonizing people. and The media are constantly uh, trying people in the press and sentencing them even before any due process kicks in, you know. So we still have these kinds of problems, and we have to try to be more resistant to them if we really want to know what's true. So we think that perhaps in some cases there, there was mental illness or other factors in play. And so witches are not today believed to exist 
in, in, in the sense that they were in Middle Ages, in late Middle Ages, okay? So these concepts of folk psychology, and here's the, here's the key point that Churchland is making, you know, when he gets to the bottom line, he's saying, well, look, the concepts of folk psychology that we all use on a daily basis, belief, desire, fear, sensation, pain, joy, all these things we describe as our emotions, our feelings, our, our intentional states, all these terms we're using to describe basically mental and emotional states, he says, he predicts that they await a similar fate. They're going to be eliminated too, and they will be eliminated if and when we're able to give a much better neuroscientific account of what it means to believe something, what does it mean to desire something, what does it mean to fear something or to sense something, or to be happy or sad about something. This is all, says Churchland, activity in the brain that needs an explanation. Well, that's right, Ramses. Witch hunts, though, are the metaphor that we use for persecution, right? If people uh, are looking for scapegoats, or looking for somebody to blame for something, uh, or a group of people to blame for something, then such people uh, may indeed be persecuted. And as we're seeing today, uh, many of our of our governmental institutions are being weaponized to go after people. Uh, and in fact, that's a witch hunt also. It doesn't mean that we think those are witches, but the metaphor uh, is, has, is very powerful. And so that endures to this day, yes? We're not literally hunting witches anymore in the way that they used to. Uh, have any of you read Arthur Miller's play, by the way, that deals with this, The Crucible? No? Ah, you might want to. Some of you have. I'm glad, Anastasia, Brandon, okay. So I'm going to put it in there because if you like literature, and we're back to the humanities now, I know that it's still being studied. Arthur Miller is a great American playwright. Um, he was also married to Marilyn Monroe at one time which must have been exciting while it lasted. But Arthur Miller <laughs> was, was, was first and foremost a playwright, and a very brilliant one. And he used this notion. He, he, the play, as some of you know, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but Arthur Miller wrote The Crucible uh, during the time of the McCarthy persecutions of suspected communists in this country. Uh, when communists were blacklisted from the from movies, when you know uh, it was owing to uh, Senator McCarthy and his and his persecution of communists. Uh, well, in fairness, to, I'm not defending persecution, but during the Cold War, there were, there was certainly a reason uh, to be wary of Soviet espionage and 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 Soviet nuclear capabilities and Stalin's 10,000 tanks poised to overrun Western Europe. I mean, there were legitimate fears. But McCarthyism went far beyond that, and it did indeed infringe uh, civil liberties of Americans who were suspected of being communists. And there were people who supported America, but supported it in a different way. The First Amendment does give us, or on a good day, gave us protections of, of belief, and including political belief. Not so much now. But Miller wrote this, uh, and there were movie stars who stood up to them, too. Humphrey Bogart lambasted them. You know, he wasn't a communist, but he went in there and defended freedom of belief and so forth. There were, there were movie stars who didn't just knuckle under and cave in. It's the same as cancel culture today. Uh, there are very few people willing to stand up at cancel culture because they don't want to be canceled. Uh, and there were very, very few people willing to stand up to the McCarthyite witch hunts because they didn't want to be canceled either. They could be prevented from working not only in the entertainment industry, they could be prevented from working for governments. They could be prevented from working as, as, as scientists. They could be prevented from working as professors. There were any number of, uh, of prescriptions. If people believe the wrong, quote unquote, the wrong things, their lives could be destroyed. You don't have to kill a person in this country to destroy their lives. You just have to take away their livelihood. That just about will do it. And uh, so M Miller wrote this satire on McCarthyism, but he said it in uh, the time of the Salem witch hunts. And it's very realistic. And as you, those of you who have read it, you know, it's a very, very powerful, evocative, dramatic play. It's extremely powerful and moving, um, but it's really a satire on McCarthyism. OK, so I'm not going to spoil the play, but that that's what comes of this notion of witches. We now have witch hunts. Uh, so you understand, back to Churchland's point, right? You see where he's going now. 
And he's saying that folk psychology, which talks about our minds and our states of mind in this very uh, waving hand waving way as I'm waving my hand, we're not really describing what's going on in the brain. We're using vocabulary language that is basically in a very fuzzy way trying to describe what's going on in our minds. And Churchland thinks that's preventing us actually from understanding more about the brain. And so we have to eliminate and, and ultimately will eliminate all those misleading and fuzzy words. And that's part of the same argument. Uh, historically, you know, we eliminated caloric and phlogiston and, and, and a lot of other things and witchcraft. And we will one day eliminate these names for our intentional states of mind once we have a better understanding of what the brain is actually doing to produce them. OK, that, that in a nutshell is uh, the main argument. And um, on Thursday, in my breakout group, and I would expect or perhaps anticipate that in your breakout groups, you will then complete this paper. Uh, and it, it, the way that it will unfold is that Churchland then gives three reasons uh, in, in support of eliminative materialism, three reasons why. And he will also give three arguments against it and he will respond to those three arguments. So that is Thursday's work. I would hope you'll read ahead. Uh, there's going to be some new vocabulary, new concepts introduced as well in that process. But please take away a bigger point from all of this for, for a second and try and retain it, that in philosophy, uh, it's a very good tactic when you write an essay uh, to anticipate a strong objection or maybe two or three objections that could be made to what you're arguing. In the context of your own essay, you say, well, I know somebody might object in the following way. And by doing this, you are showing, firstly, that you're willing to entertain two sides of a story. You're not just propagandized, you know, to, to, to reiterate, you know, one, one thread of a narrative, that you're basically willing to understand that there are different points of view. So you anticipate someone's argument that comes from a different point of view, maybe even an opposed point of view, and you acknowledge that argument, and then you yourself answer it. You say, well, okay, such and such is a very strong objection that might be raised to my argument, but here is the way in which I would answer it. So you basically uh, const reconstitute a debate within your essay, and it shows that you're willing as a philosopher, as someone with an inquiring mind, to realize that there will always be objections to anything anybody says, but to strengthen your own position, you want to entertain a strong objection and reply to it. Is this clear? This actually makes your position stronger. Yeah, okay. Counterclaim paragraphs. Okay, Ramses, what course did you do that in when you're creating counterclaim paragraphs? Is this critical thinking or is this some other, some other kind of course? Um, this was um, back in high school um, where we basically just um, it's basically a common thing to like along with stating your own ideas always have like a counterclaim or like a paragraph to like list out the counterclaims and the ways that you would um, counter the counterclaims. Exactly. And, and this will have the net effect of strengthening your argument because if someone reads your article or reads your you know your, your argument, um, then they themselves may be coming up with some of these objections. But then, then when they see that you've answered them, maybe as Churchland does, you pick three kinds of objections and you answer them, as he will do, then, then the reader is saying, well, look, this guy is actually making a strong argument because he's, ta he's tackling you know, three objections that could be made and he, he's able to rebut them. And this is a debating skill also that you would have in, you know, in, 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 a, in a verbal kind of encounter with somebody. You don't just merely keep pounding your own point home. You you want to be able to absorb and to refute or rebut an opposing view. That's a very important rhetorical skill. Lawyers need to do this in the courtroom all the time, right? And uh, professors do this uh, as well when we, when we argue, particularly in philosophy and in other allied subjects. We will make arguments and in so doing strengthen our arguments by entertaining and refuting counterclaims. So it's a good tactic, and he illustrates it very well. Uh, that's a meta point. I mean, the point is that he's going to reinforce his own theory of eliminative materialism, but the way in which he does this in this second part of the paper is a good way 
And I would encourage some of you also, no matter how strongly uh, convinced you may be of, of a given point of view, always to, to entertain um, the uh, opposed point or a strongly opposing point and then be able to respond to it. That's a real test of your own, uh, let's say, uh, ability to defend a view, to give reasons why this is a view that ought to be held. Yes, this is a very good thing. And uh, you will find in the history of debate of this kind, which unfolds in other than philosophical contexts, it unfolds in legal contexts and in political contexts constantly. Uh, back to Cicero, the, the Roman orator, and all the way through to John Stuart Mill, uh, the great 19th century utilitarian whom we'll encounter in the next section of this course, they said, and they weren't the only ones to say it, that the only way to really have understanding is to entertain both sides of a story. In fact, every story has more than two sides, probably. Every story has a lot of sides, maybe an infinite number of sides, potentially, but, but every story has at least two sides. And if we only focus on one side of the story, we, we, we are impoverishing our understanding. And it does take an open mind. And it takes the courage of your own convictions to be able to entertain and debate with somebody who disagrees with you. And part of what we're missing, uh, you know, from our own national discourse now is the ability to have such debates. What we have are, you know, networks that are deeply entrenched in one point of view and, uh, you know, a few networks that are deeply entrenched in opposing points of view, but there's no debate. They're just basically both rehearsing their own points of view constantly, and there's no interaction. And th this is the point of our whole system of law, that it is hoped that by providing an arena where contending points of view clash, the whole purpose of having a prosecution and a defense, let's say in a legal matter, be it civil or criminal, you have a prosecution and a defense, and the whole point is that in this contending arena of clashing viewpoints, you hope to be illuminating, if there is any truth in the matter, that truth. And that truth, says John Stuart Mill, as Cicero in antiquity said, can only be uncovered when we admit contending points of view. If we censor one side of an argument, we will never, never understand things as well as if we entertain both sides, okay? So there's a kind of a moral of that story also. But in science, it's, it's very important to be willing to entertain contending hypotheses in order to help us to conduct experiments which will either confirm or disconfirm them, and that through process of elimination may eventually leave standing, you know, as it were, the, the theory that actually is sound. And uh, that was Aristotle's method to a degree. That was really Socrates. If you go back to uh, the Republic, that dialogue by Plato, which is fundamentally answering the question, what is justice? It's a very long dialogue because it's not a simple question. We're going to look at extracts of it next term. But uh, Socrates uses a technique called the Elenchic method. I'll put that in. And it's, it's uh, not going to work all the time. But the Elenchic method, the Elenchus, if you like, or Elenchic method is the adjective. And what that does is it arrives at truth eventually on a good day. It arrives at truth by eliminating falsehood. So we're back to this word elimination. And Plato does a masterful job in the dialogue of the Republic in showing how early on in the dialogue, uh, next section of the course, we'll come to this, but, but Socrates very innocently asks a bunch of people he's discoursing with in the marketplace, so what's your theory of justice? What's your theory of justice? And each of them gives a kind of a homily or a very rough and ready definition of justice. And Socrates, by very careful argumentation, shows how their definition of justice could actually lead to injustice. And so, therefore, the definition can't really be a very useful one, right, or a very sound one. And so this is the method of eliminating falsehood. So what is justice, ultimately, is not just answered by diving into your pet 
theory or by getting on your hobby horse, you know, and riding off in a certain direction of what you consider justice to be, but by very carefully assessing different possible theories of justice and saying, okay, if that if that theory works, then, you know, it should not lead us to a situation of injustice. And if it does, we can eliminate it. Oh, if that theory works, it should not lead us to a situation of injustice. But if it does, we can eliminate it. And so by eliminating falsehood, it is hoped that eventually we arrive at truth. Now, that doesn't always work. Uh, doesn't always work easily and well, because in principle, if there may be one truth about a certain matter, then there would be an infinite number of falsehoods, and you may take a long time by trial and error, you know, to, to eliminate enough of them so, so that the truth eventually shines through. But nonetheless, it is a good method. And so there's something to be said for this process of elimination, uh, even, even in, you know, from antiquity. So Churchill is not really inventing this. Eliminative materialism is a reconstitution of a process and a method that was known centuries earlier by philosophers okay so uh that's the first part of the paper and uh, again on thursday uh, in in section m and i hope the, uh, the rest of you in all your other sections will uh, be able to uh continue and finish that paper by looking at churchland's three main arguments in favor of eliminative materialism and then looking at the three arguments you know, strong arguments that could be raised as objections to it and, 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 and his answers to them. Uh, and now he and his wife, I gather, are very sincere about this. I haven't had breakfast with them. I don't, haven't met them personally. Uh, but they apparently did this in their own interactions. They eliminated as much of this vague folk psychology as they could so they, they would never have a normal conversation with each other <laughs> because they would have eliminated all these intentional states of mind words and all these other kinds of words that we use on a regular basis. So they would have a kind of a, a very strange conversation trying to, to stick to words that are precise and scientifically meaningful. But they certainly walk the walk. Okay, are there any questions about anything we've covered today? Because that was the goal, to, to do that much of the reading, to set it up and, and, and then to, to look at it. Are we clear, are you clear about, about Churchland's main claim and are you clear about uh, the historical examples he gives, uh, in which successful eliminations have actually conduced to a better understanding. Clear? Good? Okay. Well, that's fine. And so, um, yes, okay, glad, glad to see all of this feedback. Always good to be clear. We started off clear. We got into some new, new waters today, um, historically, scientifically, terminologically. But if we're emerging with clarity from that, then that, that's good. Uh, that's a very good class, I would say, successful in that sense. But are there questions lingering from this? Because you realize, of course, that, that his claim is really radical, and we can't really fully employ this today because our scientific knowledge of the brain is not advanced enough, yeah? You understand this? Because ultimately where he's going is uh, to a place that we haven't arrived at. Uh, we, we don't know how much of our vocabulary would have to be eliminated. Uh, we don't know what will remain if and when we get a complete scientific picture of the functioning of the brain. We don't know if we ever will get one. That's complete. Maybe never. But uh, this is a direction. Do you think it's fruitful? Are you, are you impressed by this? Are you interested in it? Does it resonate with you at all? Are you in shock? What, what's, your, what's, your, <laughs> what's your sense of of what we've covered today. Well, Ramses, you know, if we look at, uh, at at that question, so will neuroscience be the future of modern thinking? Well, postmodern or post-postmodern, but sure. Wouldn't you suppose that that we're still thinking about thinking the way Descartes was? Right? Four centuries ago, Descartes was thinking about thinking and we're still thinking about thinking that way. We haven't really understood what it means to think. Yeah? We just go on thinking. Uh, but we certainly know that that there's there seems to be a very strong correlation between what goes on in the brain and what goes on in the mind. And so maybe those are really not two different things either. There's an equivalence like the matter-energy equivalence. And maybe... Uh, the matter of brain and the energy of thought are really two manifestations of the same thing, and that thing would be a different physical picture of the universe than we have now. But we've developed our thinking throughout each generation. Yes, we have. 
uh, but we still don't know what it really means to think something or how, how, how it is that we think. What is a thought? Let me ask you that. We're back to that. What are the properties of a thought? You know, does it have physical properties? It seems not to. If we ask what what's the mass of a thought, you know, what's the weight of a thought? What's the what's the color of a thought? You know, what's what does a thought smell like? What does a thought feel like? We we can't uh, we can't attribute physical properties to thought. Descartes would say because it's mind stuff, not not body stuff. But um, then what is it? And what kind of energy is it? Is consciousness a field of energy which is somehow radiating out of the brain? Uh, and so it really is a different kind of thing. But then what are the laws that produce it? Yeah, of course we develop our thinking, but what we haven't developed, Ramsey, is an, is an understanding of what's happening in the brain when we think. Clear? We can take pictures, you know, so we have better imaging of the brain now. Well, there you go. Daily, is that how to pronounce your name, Daily? We can't cut a brain up and see thoughts inside it. Well, we better not do that on living people because ethically it wouldn't be a good idea. But, you know, people examined Einstein's brain after he died. I think his family gave them the right to kind of preserve his brain. And I think Einstein's brain may well be sitting in a vat somewhere, a formaldehyde at Princeton. I don't know, but it may be there. And people have certainly been interested in cutting up Einstein's brain after he died to look inside and see how was it very different from other brains? No, it just looks like a brain. So why were the quality of Einstein's thoughts and the originality and depth of his perceptions at the time about the physical world, um, why were they so profound? Well, there's nothing in his brain that tells us this, right? So uh, how do we explain that? And that's part of the, the whole question. We don't know enough about the brain to be able to use the brain as a basis for exploring or understanding consciousness. And uh, Arsh asks, can't we attribute sensible approach toward a thought because we can go from sense to thought, we can't go from thought to sense. That's also interesting, Arsh, but let me submit to you something um, a little bit different. I mean, that's a really good point. Uh, do, do you think that that the brain, let's say there are two different things as we're speaking in ordinary language of them. Do you think that your brain, that your mind can affect your body? Can your state of mind affect your state of body? Yes, of course, of course it can. And you all know this, right? Because you can, for example, undertake certain kinds of breathing, uh, willfully, you could slow down your, you know, you can lower your blood pressure, you can placebo effect, you think you've been given a drug that's going to help you and it helps you even though it's a sugar pill, because in your mind, you think that this thing I'm taking, this placebo, you think it's real medicine, and it has an effect on your body as though it were. So that's a great example. Uh, so we know that, uh, and you know, people who, who, who are unhappy in their minds will also depress their immune systems. The immune system is measurable. You know, we can, we can have all kinds of ways through blood tests and other things of, of measuring, uh, you know, the state of our immune systems. And we know that if people are unhappy, their immune systems are generally not as functional. If people are happy, they have a better immune system. And we know that all of those things are evidence all collectively that what we think has an effect on what we feel and on what the body's doing, but it works the other way around too. Does it not? Isn't it the case that uh, that your state of mind is also affected by your body? And what your body's going through? For sure, for sure. You know, if you're tired, you don't think as well generally, right? Or if you're unhappy, you don't think. If you're angry, you know, I mean, if your body, if something is happening to your body, which which is upsetting you, then your mind is not going to work as well as it, as it would work if your body wasn't in pain or in distress or ill or any number of other things. So so it seems that there's a, there is an intimate relation between mind and body. But then we're back to the problem. How do we explain it? And that's really a problem that is still addressed by philosophers and by neuroscientists and by psychologists and uh, neuroendocrinologists, I mean, all kinds of sciences have input now into this problem. The medium. Yeah, Arsh, we don't know the medium. We don't know, we still don't know whether there's one medium or two media, right? We don't know if body and brain, I mean, mind and brain are one thing or two things. And if they're two things, how do they relate? You know, and if they're one thing only and that thing is physical, which Churchill believes, then how do we actually explain in some comprehensible way 
how our thoughts themselves translate into electrochemical activity in the brain and we don't know we don't simply don't know this yet so is mind a part of brain well that's the whole question is it the same thing as brain is it another way of describing something which can be equally well or better described by brain these are all really important questions and we're only at the threshold of explanation because of all the organs of the body fair to say that um that the brain is the least well understood it's the most complex by far and the least well understood or is, is, con is consciousness sitting outside the brain listen that's another another part of this big debate you know entails the question about consciousness and whether consciousness is localized somewhere in the body or whether in fact consciousness is dispersed like cloud computing consciousness may may be local or it may not be local we don't really know that's part of a, of, a, of, a, of another kind of related problem a very difficult one certainly uh, th and this is why we're still doing uh, philosophy because we have all these really interesting questions without uh, definitive answers yeah there's even a book there's even a book that's been written out there um, by some some neuroscientists it's called the god part of the brain so people are now trying to explain religious belief in terms of what's going on in the brain someplace like there's this god part there's a part of if you were a religious person then you know then there's a part of your brain which is active presumably that's the hypothesis or what's what's being defended here and that is what is quote unquote causing uh, or reinforcing uh, religious belief that it's really a part of your brain which is doing this uh, yes the whole world is conscious you have the Gaia hypothesis uh, Kendrick and the you know there are all kinds of theories of holism uh, and interconnectedness which tell us that consciousness in, in a sense that ecosystems have a kind of consciousness not in the way we do uh, they don't have intentional states, but they nonetheless have consciousness. Look, your tree has some kind of ability to respond. You know, deciduous trees know. Uh, no, I'm saying not epistemologically or maybe not even in the sense of techne, uh, but, well, they certainly know how to shed their leaves in the winter and they know how to know how to regrow fresh leaves in the spring, and that's all about ambient temperature uh, and changes. Uh, but somehow there's something in the tree which allows it to respond appropriately and live longer than us, uh, and and yet the tree has no central nervous system in the sa same way we do, right? And no brain in the way that we do. So these are all interesting questions, and I hope that uh, this has provoked you to think, whatever that means, and we'll continue this on Thursday with Section M, and I wish you a fruitful uh, encounter with the remaining portion of Churchland's paper, and I'm very glad to see that many of you are now stimulated to think more carefully about this very interesting set of questions, okay? And I wish you all a safe and productive week. Uh, see you all Monday next week, and we'll see Section M on uh, on Thursday. All right, take care, everybody. I'll stop Thursday, Thank you, Professor. Good one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Enjoy your week. Thank you very much indeed. Have a wonderful week.